So, uh, well, I have to thank Im Chiaos for that kind introduction. I also thank uh, Andrew Copson at Humanist UK for the initial introduction. Uh, and Andrew just walked in at the back there. Um, since I'm in front of a gathering of humanists, I think it's best I start with a confession. Uh, the confession is I'm a bit nervous about this lecture. I'm used to giving conference lectures and teaching, but I wasn't sure about the level to pitch it. Uh, I know there's a few scientists in the audience. There's a large number of non-scientists in the audience. So that level to pitch it, I wasn't sure. So I asked Andrew, what shall I talk about? And he said, about 35 minutes. <laughs> so for the next 34 minutes, I'm going to give you a flavor of the research I do, but also a bit of a, bit of a personal humanist journey as well. And I call it Supercharged, which was the name of my Christmas lectures, a humanist journey with green energy, batteries included. Um, 3D specs on, um, for the best effect, I find, is that, uh, as in politics, red is on the left and where my heart is. And if you look at that and stare at it, for the best of it, if you move your head side to side, and if that doesn't work, it makes me smile from here. Uh, but I'll talk about that. That is crystalline beauty. And I'll talk about crystal beauty in a second. So let me start off with an outline, the menu of my talk. I'm going to have... The menu is uh, a brief starter on energy and crystals, not the new age variety, I should add. Uh, and then charging ahead, I'll be talking about lithium batteries and how we're going to uh, try and improve them. Then a bit of a personal, um, what, who do you think uh, I am uh, or you are? And then lastly, a familiar face, I think, to many of you, um, Dawkins at Christmas. So what is that image and what does it mean? Uh, so, and obviously, if you've got your phones on, turn them off now. Right. Um, we know energy is a major challenge for this century. And energy storage, storing energy, is arguably more important now than any time in human history. Uh, these are some successful uh, devices in the portable revolution. Love them or just about tolerate them, they are now become ubiquitous. Uh, my teenage daughter has one permanently kind of sellotaped to her left uh, hand. And that is my iPod, so my taste in 1980s music, the, my favorite band, The Smiths. But anyway, uh, size is important. Uh, and here, it's because of lithium. Lithium is the smallest and lightest metal ion in the whole periodic table. And that's why it's been used within lithium batteries. And I'll talk about them in a second. But what's the next challenge? Well, the next challenge is can we use those same energy storage devices, those lithium batteries, to instigate a sort of electrification of transport, electric vehicles revolution? We're sort of on the cusp of it. Um, there are issues that we are still using fossil fuels. But some of them have been very successful. The Toyota Prius, the hybrid, um, has sold over 6 million, uh, the Tesla and the BMW i3 on, on the bottom. I am not a car engineer, and I show this schematic not because I love Top Gear, but look at the figure at the top there. Um, it says, battery recharge plug not to scale. <laughs> I do like that, not to scale. It's going to be this massive plug you're going to kind of drive around with. I like that, not to scale. Um, it's like when you have that packet of nuts and it says, this product may contain nuts. You know. uh, right, so let's... Um, so really, my research is about, I suppose, materials chemistry at the fundamental level. That's why I went into academia, and that's why I love science. You can really advance knowledge. Um, as we will discuss later on, scientists are, readily, are happy to admit their ignorance. It's the whole point of doing research is that you're trying to further knowledge. So um, breakthroughs will come through new materials and a greater fundamental understanding. And that's really the philosophy of my research for the last 30 years. So, uh, oh, here, I, 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 this is a reminder to myself, I could produce a quote from a Nobel laureate or a previous US president, uh, but I went with a different type of philosopher. 
and it's to do with green energy, and it ain't easy being green. <laughs> and Kermit is right, it's not easy being green. Uh, fossil fuels will still probably dominate for some time in the electricity sector, but we can do our bit. So uh, what are the questions for this talk? Well, there are two, three main questions I'm, hopefully I'll address. One is, what do materials look like on the atomic level for those non-scientists out there? And what are the crystals in your phone right now? And how do they work? And lastly, probably the most controversial question is, was Shakespeare a chemist? And hopefully I will answer those questions. So let's start off with, what do I do? Um, so when I, when I go to parties, dinner parties, uh, that's when you get invited, that is. Uh, somehow when you mention you're a chemistry professor, the, the kind of invitations dry up. You know, they're, they're one evening in the week they have to sit next to a chemistry professor. Go, why, why me? Uh, anyway, so when I go to parties, when they ask me, what do you do, Seifel? I say, I model. And uh, <laughs> rather than modeling down the catwalk, I use computer modeling. So I'm one of those chemists that does not wear a white lab coat. I'm happily tapping away, developing computer models. And one of the best examples of computer, well, I suppose not computer modeling, model making or model is this iconic photo of Watson and Crick back in 1953 in their lab in Cambridge. And this is modeling. They were building up the structure of the molecule of life, DNA, using data of Rosalind Franklin. And they used clamps and retort stands to build up that double helix. They beat Linus Pauling to, uh, to actually um, determine the structure. Nowadays, you can do that within a minute using a computer. You just have to build up those different chemical bonds. So that is modeling really at the basic level. So what do I look at? Well, I look at crystals. These are crystalline materials with a lot of symmetry. And the next one is a crystal that you're all familiar with. It's salt, uh, something that you sprinkle on your chips or your pasta, in my case, before a tequila shot. Uh, and this is what crystals look like. That's obviously, but when you look at it, and this is the beauty of science, you can see at the microscopic level, the beautiful crystals, then to there, and then right at the atomic level to here. So back with your 3D glasses, I'm going to put mine on. As I said, red on the left and wiggle your head about a bit. So this is sodium chloride. This is just common salt. And I call it a salt on your senses. So the large ions, the large spheres, are charged chloride ions. The small spheres are charged sodium, sodium ions. And really, it's the beauty of symmetry. They are a, a regular crystalline structure that's repeated many times. So it's not a molecule. It's repeated many times to form this crystal structure. But there's an important property of these crystals is that some of the ions are in the wrong place. And they can conduct. So have a stare. So look at that. Ooh. Yeah, just stare at that. It's mesmerizing, isn't it? So I, it's so mesmerizing, I'm going to do it again, uh, but with a few more. Yeah. Yes, come on, come on. A few more reaction. Thank you. It took hours by a, to put together by a slave PhD student. Uh, so that's iron. But that's the fact that ions can move, iron conduction. And uh, I do the Christmas lectures, and one of the godfathers of iron conduction was Michael Faraday, probably one of my scientific heroes. Um, he's a hero because not only was he a, a fantastic scientist, but he came from very humble beginnings. Um, I think his father was just a blacksmith up in Yorkshire, and he went on to become one of the greatest scientists the world has ever produced. So another property of crystals is that they have these impurities. And this fascinates new age kind of They think they can feel the crystal energy when they walk into uh, a crystal shop. I said, have you tried it with your eyes closed? Uh, you know, we need some evidence. And, but beautiful gemstones are because there are some impurities in there. So the emeralds, the rubies are all showing impurities. And one of the best examples of impurities 
is from Breaking Bad. Uh, that is impure. The stuff I make is clear. Uh, <laughs> this crystal meth. That should not be blue. That's just for TV effect, I think. Uh, anyway, this leads on to the controversy. Shakespeare. So in Midsummer Night's Dream, when Demetrius wakes up and sees Helena for the first time, he says these words to Helena. He says, to what shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. What Shakespeare's trying to say here is that compared to Helena's beautiful eyes, the crystals contain ionic impurities. <laughs> yes. So you heard it from here first. Shakespeare was a solid state chemist as well as a, a brilliant writer. So what's inside a lithium? So if some of you might say, Sifor, what is inside a lithium ion battery? And I would say that's a very good question. I don't know whether I've got a good answer, but here is my attempt. It's basically a sandwich. It's an electrochemical sandwich. And this returns to Faraday, one of the really great forerunners of electrochemistry. It's basically chemistry with an electrical process. So it's a sandwich. So like any sandwich, you had two bread slices. And the bread slices here are the two electrodes, the oxide electrode on your left and the graphite electrode on your right. And as you can see, they're very layered, sheet-like structures. And, what, and you've got an electrolyte in between, which allows the ions to move, but not electrons. So the ions can move. So when you're at home tonight, and you're charging your phone, lithiums will move from the positive electrode over to the negative electrode. And that's what that green symbol is indicating. Lithium ions moving, chemistry in action. So when you see that green symbol tonight, just tell yourself, oh, chemistry is working right now. And, uh, but when you charge, when you actually discharge it, when you're using your phone, discharging it, lithium ions are going the other way, but releasing an electron, which is which has got off, its, off the mains, and it's charging your device. So the problem really are twofold. One is the, this positive electrode is largely cobalt. Cobalt is both toxic and expensive. And the electrolyte in between is a flammable liquid. And that's why very occasionally, I mean, it's very rare con considering how many cells are sold every year, there is an occasional fire. And, but you do get quite a lot of thermal runaway. So that's why new materials and new science is required. And this is where I come in. And uh, if my clicker works. So here, the name is Bond, chemical bond. Uh, I, I show this because I want to illustrate some simple chemical. So this is cobalt in the center connected to six oxygens. And for those keen followers of solid state chemistry will know oxygens are in red. Uh, and cobalt here, or in fact, in this case, phosphorus, and connected to four oxygens. But another way of representing that uh, is by these shapes, this octahedral shape and this tetrahedron shape. So why do I show that? Well, I show that because the next 3D images, that's very important. So if you get your glasses on again, you're going to see, and I promised you, what does the material in your phone look like? And this is it, this very layered sheet light structure. It's time for my glasses as well. So this is in your phone right now. Uh, this is li lithium cobalt oxide. The spheres are the lithium ions, and those sheets are the cobalt oxide sheets. And you can just about see those octahedra connected by their edges to form these lovely sheets. And you can imagine lithium ions as you're charging coming in and out, out between those layers. So as in life, the important stuff is happening between the sheets. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I, that's one of my defects. Uh, so, but we want to move away from cobalt. So I said we're going to look at new materials. So one of the most abundant or elements in the Earth's crust is iron. Uh, it's all around us, rust as well. So we're looking at this new material. So even if you're not into structural chemistry, I hope you can see the beauty of this structure. This is the olivine structure. It's naturally occurring. Um, you find it in uh, basalts and metamorphic rocks near, usually near uh, volcanic activity like Mount Etna. Uh, anyway, this is an iron-based material. And you can see straight away, it's a very different structure from the lithium cobalt oxide. It's much more 
tunnel light. The yellows are the lithiums coming towards you. The octahedra iron and the tetrahedra are phosphate groups. And this is lithium iron phosphate. This has what we call the X factor. Uh, it's it's non-toxic, it's cheaper, and it also it's safer. It's got stronger bonding within that structure. And as you can imagine, you can imagine the lithium ions in this case are coming out in one dimension, a bit like a tube train, those channels coming towards you. So we've been doing a lot of work on that material, and you'll hear more about that hopefully in the future. So uh, keep your specs on. This is 3D as well. So I work in a big research consortium, and part of that research consortium are some engineers. I actually link up with some engineers. And this is the test vehicle up at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, this is the beautiful AC Cobra. So it's a bit like Bond-like again. And uh, as you can see from what they're wearing, it was a, it was a relatively warm day in Glasgow that day. <laughs> uh, and the last one, this is the last 3D image. This is... This is the, oh, I like this. This has yeah, got nothing to do with my research, but I love this image. It's a bit spooky. So if you move your head around, it's creepy how those antennae follow you around. <laughs> they kind of just come out to you. So that is produced by 3dimages.co.uk. Uh, so that is the wake-up call. Right. So how, oh, so this, so how do the ions move within that? So uh, I think... We're going to have a click to see the movie in action. Yes, so here, as I said, important stuff between the sheets, as ever. And you can see the greens are the lithium ions, the red are the oxygens, the blue are the cobalt. So as you're charging your phone, we can model how lithium ions move. And this is where computer modeling comes in. Lithium is tiny. It's, as I said before, it's the smallest metal ion in the periodic table. So it's very hard to probe by experiment alone. So this is where computer modeling comes in. We can look at how lithium ions move through your crystalline structure and understand a bit more about how they work. So let me move, finish this um, science section, in a way, by a quote. It's not a quote from Charles Darwin himself, but it's a quote that I saw at a beautiful exhibition at the Natural History Museum I took my daughter to. And the quote is actually from Marcel Proust. And I wrote it down because it to me, it talks about science in general, but, by, but about materials modeling in particular. And the quote is, the real voyage of discovery consists not only in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So I think that's a beautiful quote about science. Basically, we have new eyes. So let me move on to uh, a bit about myself. I, it's always, this is the hardest part of the talk. I've never really done this before. And because this was an unusual conference, I thought I'd say a bit about, about who do you think you are. And the obvious place to start is my lovely mum and dad. Uh, we arrived in 1964. We arrived in London from uh, Pakistan via East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. Uh, my dad is called Aminul. He died in 1993. Mum Maya died 2002. Sadly, they died in the late 50s, uh, relatively early, so they didn't really see me on BBC TV, which is a shame. Um, Dad was in the civil service in Karachi, even though he's from East Pakistan, and he was posted to London. And he, he was very excited. He was, he was quite a, I suppose, he was interested in the world, and he was happy to come to London. But then, soon after 64, uh, civil war broke out between the two Pakistans, West and East and Bangladesh was formed, and he moved over to the British Civil Service, uh, the Department of Trade and Industry, as it was called then, uh, and where he stayed until he died. Um, and I've got a good story about him at his workplace. He used to get Christmas cards with the word, Dear the General. And, you know, all these Christmas cards, the general, and I asked him why, and it's because his name, Aminul, was abbreviated to Amin, and around that time, <laughs> there was Edi Amin, and then he became the general, I mean, and then he just became called the general. And there were, there were new colleagues that came into the department. He was just a, dad was just a, a librarian. He said, let me introduce you to the general. They also thought my dad was a general. He'd never been anywhere near the army, but he's called the general. Mum, I have a lot of admiration for mum. Mum obviously came here without knowing any English, but she was really the, I call the household manager. I don't like the term housewife. She was a household manager. She kept the house going, and uh, I'm very proud of her and how she kept the family going. 
I was born in Karachi, and I came over here when I was only one. And that's one of my two younger sisters. My sisters were born in London. And uh, so growing up in the 1970s was always interesting. I grew up in a place called Crouch End, uh, North London. Um, it was rough then, but now it's become quite trendy. It's now called Le Crouchonde. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's become very trendy. And I went, to, I went to a standard state school, a boys' comprehensive, and people have asked me, what does Saiful mean? I actually share my name with Gaddafi's son. Uh, Saiful, sometimes it's hyphenate, means sword of. And my first name is Mohammed, so I'm Mohammed, sword of Islam. I mean, great, isn't it, for, a, for an ex-Muslim atheist? To <laughs> sword of Islam. I'm kind of sword of atheism now. Uh, so, and I went there. Um, my school doesn't exist anymore. It was not a fantastic school. And it was rough in the 70s. Um, I remember that used to check for, when you go into the school, they used to check for knives. And if you didn't have one, they gave you one. Uh, uh, so, but there was a, a darker side to the 70s. The darker side was the after Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood. There was the growth of skinheads and packy bashing. And unfortunately, uh, like many others of my, we were victims of packy bashing. One still stays with me. Uh, I was beaten up in front of my, one of my younger sisters. So uh, that was a, I had a happy childhood. It was in a happy environment, but these incidents did occur. It was almost part and parcel. You never reported it to the police. You felt that this was actually part of uh, London life, that you were beaten up by skinheads. It's really strange. That, but you kind of block it out now. Uh, so... I, mum was the most religious, dad was less so. In fact, dad I would class as more agnostic. And I think it's because he was very much affected by partition and how that was really affected by religion, you know, dividing India up in on religious grounds. And he didn't like that. In fact, uh, on politics, he was quite on the left. Really, in my early teens, school science, school science, I suppose, fed me the idea of evidence. I mean, it's not surprising as you go to school, you're told that you should be picking up more knowledge, you should be asking questions. So I asked, and I think my mum was really worried, I kept asking her really difficult questions, because then she got uh, an imam in to talk to me. And I think the reason why she was worried, I think she was really worried. I have, and because I haven't really had a really good discussion, we just agreed to differ. So at that age, and again, I'm, not, I'm sure this is common to many of you, I did not know that non-belief was an option. So I, didn't I hadn't heard of the term atheism or the term humanism at those teenage years. But then later on, I realized that there was an alternative option. I went, um, I managed to work hard enough at my A-levels and at that school and managed to get into University College London to read chemistry. Like all Asian parents, they wanted me to become a doctor. Uh, <laughs> But I resisted, and I followed my passion, and I'm glad I did. I would have made a terrible doctor. But I, I tell them I did marry one in the end. So I, I married a doctor. Uh, uh, and then after my PhD, I was fortunate enough to go to New York to work for Kodak. For the young ones in the audience, this is called photographic film. <laughs> this is photographic film. I used to, get you used to buy this from Boots. You put it in your camera, you used to have 24 or 36 photos, then you took it back to Boots, they used to develop it, about half of them were rubbish, and then you, uh, that's what photographic film, but... So the, the dirty word that killed off Kodak is the word digital. So digital has killed off Kodak, but I had a couple of happy, happy years in New York working for Kodak. So let me move on towards the conclusion, and that is the Christmas lectures. I was very fortunate to be invited to do the Christmas lectures. Uh, when I first told my kids, they, they were really excited. And I asked them, you know, should I be funny? Shall I be witty? Shall I be clever? And they said, no, Dad, just, just be yourself. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And if you haven't seen them, uh, shame on you. Uh, they, were, they were in 2016. This is the opening shot. So it's called Supercharged. So I was very fortunate because this was the 80th anniversary of the first TV lectures. The first ones were in 1936. 
actually, strange enough, were filmed in Alexandra Palace, just up the road from Crouchen. So I actually had a sort of geographical connection to that first lectures of 1936 filmed. Anyway, because of the 80th anniversary, I could invite Xmas lecturers past. And I invited all the ones I wanted to. The one person who couldn't make it, sadly, he was successful after Blue Planet, Planet, Blue Planet 2 was David Attenborough. But I managed to invite somebody that is familiar to this audience, a previous president and vice president, Richard Dawkins, uh, again, one of my current scientific heroes, but I showed a little clip of him. So I reprised one of his demos that he did back in 1979. He did this uh, pendulum demo, and he used the line, faith in science. Uh, and basically, it's this big metal ball. He let it go from here, and because of the conservation energy, it will not go any further. And, but I made a difference. I put big spikes on that ball, <laughs> massive spikes on that ball. And Richard was really generous. It was soon after his, um, his minor stroke. But he came and did a couple of rehearsals. We had lunch together, and we chatted to him. So it was lovely to meet him. It was the first time I'd actually sat down and chatted to him. And he came to do, and he was really happy about that demo. And he did it again. And obviously, he said faith in science. And I, I talked about the conservation in energy from uh, potential to kinetic, back to potential. And as you can see, um, it didn't go past. But I always felt if there was ever a moment for God to reveal himself, <laughs> surely this would be the moment. Yes, a little time, you know, a little thing, straight into Dawkins' face. No, it didn't happen. So surely that's another piece of evidence. I remind the non-believers. So um, I, uh, yes, so I showed how a battery worked, not by, by a simple experiment, which is a lemon. You can put a, a copper a nail in there and a magnesium strip, and you can, make, you can actually get a, a voltage, about 1.4 volts from a lemon battery. But I said to the Royal Institution, I want to go large. I want to go very large. In fact, I want a world record. Yes, and we got a world record. So this is in lecture three. Richard Dawkins in the first 10 minutes of lecture one. Go to the Royal Institution website. If you haven't seen them, I recommend watching them. Um, so we, I got the Royal Institution to buy 1,008 lemons. We cut, I got my research group to cut them in half to get 2016 lemon slices. So uh, that was cutting edge technology. <laughs> boom, boom, tsh. And, uh, but also, we used them for gin and tonic afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but we connected them up, and we did break. We got to 1,400 volts. That was a world record. And we're in the Guinness Book of World Records, and the Guinness rep was there. We shook his hand, and there was a big um, firework, uh, not firework, a big kind of display when I went back into the lecture theatres. That, that was just outside the lecture theatre there. Uh, as I said, we had lectures, lecture, Christmas lectures passed. This is Alison Woolard, a previous lecturer. I got her to connect it up to some electrical wires. Uh, at the bottom is Danielle George racing a, a Tesla versus a normal sports car. And on the right, he wasn't a Christmas lecturer, but he was our family favorite of the British Great Bake Off that year. <laughs> that was Selassie. I don't know if you remember, remember 2016 Great Bake Off. Selassie got to the, I think, semis, semi-final there. But he came on to bring some cakes on right at the end. There have only been seven, actually, when I did them, only six women um, Christmas lecturers. So I invited all six on. Um, three could make it. Uh, so I was really pleased that I could get 50% of all that were on. And there, Alison and uh, Daniel have become good friends since then. So let me begin to end. Uh, I don't know how we did. Are we OK? Yes? Great. So if you want some further information, about my research or some of my activities. If you Google Seifel Bath, um, I'm number one hit. I promise you don't get a dodgy image <laughs> of, of me in, in a bath. Uh, and for those into social media, um, I'm on Twitter. The institution and the Royal Society forced me to go onto Twitter, and I'm Seifel Chemistry. But if you want to tweet and take photos with your 3D specs on, Use the hashtag 3D Specs Chem. So this is some earlier school children who did it. I think they've now formed a boy band called, called Three Dimensions. Uh, 
and boom. And some early adopters, you've got uh, the chemist here, part-time writer, but mainly a chemist, and uh, from the Big Bang on the right here. So I'm going to end with the F word. The F word in the university circles is feedback. We're now asked to get feedback from our undergraduates and postgraduates, a lot of feedback. So I got some feedback from my lecture course, and I got this in one of the written lecture assessment forms. And the feedback was, if I had only one hour to live, I'd attend <laughs> one of your lectures. <laughs> however, however, because it would feel like an eternity. <laughs> thank you. On that note, thank you very much.